few months back, you obviously suffered one of the worst injuries I've probably seen someone suffer. Um, pretty bad leg break. Talk to us about that experience. Yes, it's about as bad as injuries you can get apart from breaking your neck, basically, <laughs> apart from hit one under being paralyzed, you know. So at the London Open back in February, um, I fought my key division on a Saturday at middleweight. And in Nogi on a Sunday, there was no one in my weight class. Um, so I went up two weight classes to heavyweight and also went up an age division. So it's my first ever fight in Master 2 because I qualified for Master 2 this year. So I was like, oh, I'll go up in weight, you know, but I'll jump down in terms of like difficulty, supposedly. Didn't work out though. <laughs> so I had one match, uh, got caught in a toehold and within one second of being in a toehold, my leg snapped in half. That was a ruthless injury. Basically, so the guy connected, it was like um, pretty quick. So he connected his hands. If you look back on the video from literally the moment he connected his hands to the moment my leg snapped, it's one second. And I tapped just before that. So I tapped in just under a second, but it's not enough. So I tried to roll through as he was going, for ten, he was turning like belly down to go for the toe hold. Um, I turned away trying to roll with it, but because he had like a outside ashy, like his leg was passed over the outside of my hip. It stopped me from rolling through. So I just turned, posted my hands on the mat, got stuck, reached back to tap and uh, yeah, just snapped straight away. So the moment my leg snapped, I didn't actually realize it had broken. I knew something had happened. I was like, oh fuck. Like it was super painful. So like I said, it was all quick, right? So the guy's putting on the toe hold. I felt like a crazy amount of pressure in my leg straight away. I was like, fuck, try to go with it. And then when it broke, I just felt like a could like something go. I was like, in the in the second now, I was like, fuck, I hope that wasn't my knee. Like, I hope, you know, you don't know, you think, like trying to play off to yourself, like maybe, maybe it's not that bad, maybe it's just something clunked. Like, I knew there was a clunk, but I was like, maybe it was my knee just clicking. I was like, I hope my ACL isn't gone or something like that. I was like, fuck it. This is all like going from a head in like one second. Yeah, yeah. I turned around, sit up, grab my leg, and was like, oh fuck, my shin snapped in half. I was like, because I felt it straight away. I put my hands on my leg. Yeah. And I felt the bone like. Yeah, I've seen the video like, and you just oh. looked and yeah. <laughs> so straight away, I was, the pain wasn't even the main thing. I was like, just super pissed off. I was fucking angry because I was like, what the fuck? Just snapped my leg in half. You know, like it, it's so unnecessary. You know, like with jujitsu competition, you know, we're not getting paid. One, I tapped. I know it was quick, so I'm, I'm not like, saying, oh, he, sh he didn't have the chance to let go from the tap, but he didn't give me also the chance to tap either, you know? So it was one of those where you go so hard on a submission that you're, you're, not, even, um, you're not even looking for a tap. You're just trying to break the leg, mm -hmm. right? If we did the same thing, we, we could do the same thing with every submission, right? If every time you get a guy in an armbar, you just snap his arm over your hip, whether he taps or not, it's not going to change anything. His arm's still going to break. Right, so we always take the submission to the point of breaking and then apply pressure until you get a tap. Right, you don't just whip it across your hip and snap somebody's arm. The same thing, toe hold, you go belly down, snap, just like break the leg. It's also a really unusual place for a unusual injury to get from a toe hold. Yeah. Normally toe holds applying pressure to your ankle ligaments, right? So your ATFL, which is your anterior tibiofibular ligament, which is like you get from inversion injuries, rolling over your ankle you know if you like basically roll your ankle yeah it's the same as a toe hold right? yeah. you snap the ligaments there so my ankle didn't get injured at all in the toe hold just straight through the middle of the tibia and fibula so it was a spiral a comminuted spiral fracture spiral mean going around the bone it's not a straight line um comminuted mean meaning it's in multiple pieces so it's not just snapped in two it's snapped into like four or five pieces so it just basically exploded in the middle of my leg Hey guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests. And at the, at the time, I was just immediately pissed off because, and like, like very like stressed about the situation more than the pain, because I was supposed to be flying to Cameroon the following morning to see my family there. The, some of my family who are still in Cameroon, I have um, a girlfriend and a baby there in Cameroon, 
he was 10 months old at the time. So it was supposed to be the first time I would have seen him since he was one month old. Me and Frank obviously left like a month after he was born. And then because of Frank's visa issues, we couldn't go back. Uh, after, we were supposed to be gone for six months, couldn't get back. So this was like 10 months. Uh, and yeah, night before we travel, snapped my leg. And I was just thinking, fucking, I'm not going to Cameroon now. Like, I don't think I'll be going anywhere. All this shit's running through my head like, okay, so I'm not going to be doing fucking anything for the next year. You know, I'm a qualified physio as well. So I know like this kind of um, what's entailed what, with this kind of uh, injury, you know, severe fracture like that. You know, I worked in orthopedics before. Um, so I was thinking, fucking, I'm, basically everything's over. Like my life's basically <laughs> fucked for the next year. Like I, was, I won't be able to teach, I won't be able to walk, I won't be able to do any jiu-jitsu, I won't be able to travel. You know, I'll just be basically sitting at home getting Frank to cook me dinner. <laughs> so yeah, all that was running from my head rather than the actual, um, the pain of people saying, oh, you handled it really well. You weren't freaking out too much. Because I was thinking about all this other stuff straight away. I was like, oh my God, fucking hell, this is going to be like, it's not that, that moment that it's a problem. The pain in a, for a, for a, you know, a short amount of time is, is nothing compared to the effect that an injury like that has on your life in general. Yeah, you know, for a long time. For a long afterward. time. Yeah, I've had a yeah. really savage uh, arm break like that, and yeah, it takes it takes a while. It takes a while because it just doesn't ever seem to get fucking better. You know, especially where you're at now, you feel like you know you feel like you can move and whatever, but it's still it takes so long, doesn't it? And it's mentally as well. Think about it, like if someone asked me if they would like if they if I could go through the same moment again to snap my leg, I would have that in a heartbeat if it would be fixed afterward. You know, I would, the problem the pain of having your leg snapped is nothing compared to the problems you get afterward. Yeah. And that's the thing I think as well, that obviously you keep saying snap, but you just explain the actual stent of the injury and yeah. it's not as quick as just a clean break, right? Yeah. So basically I got um, taken to the hospital in London. They were, it was like a big trauma hospital, King's College Hospital. So they were busy. They didn't have any space in the operating theaters on the initial day. So I thought, that probably they're gonna operate on the same day. And that was like a, a possibility, right? If they had space, they would have took me in overnight operation, job done. But I actually was staying in the hospital for three days without any surgery because every day they were saying, oh, a new case, urgent case is coming in. You know, my, my fracture was like uh, not a priority because basically the bone didn't come out of the skin because it was a closed fracture. I said there was less infection risk. So if somebody breaks a bone and the, the bone yeah, pierces the skin, it's much uh, bigger infection risk. So they have to prioritize those people over people with closed fractures. So even though my fracture was bad, the, the break was bad, the bone was like shattered inside, it was closed. So they could afford to like leave me in a hospital bed for a few days, waiting for a, basically a spot yeah. in the surgery. So I, yeah, three days until I had the surgery and that was so fucking painful. Sitting there in the hospital with my leg like grinding. If I moved a tiny bit, it's like it's weird. I know, I know that feeling. It's bone fucking bone. minging, isn't it? You can't even explain it to people, can you? Because it it, it it like clunks. Uh, those three days traumatic. Because I was like on my own in the hospital. My mum came up, so Frank was with me. Obviously, when I broke my leg, we went to hospital together. But then he travelled back down to Torquay. I think the following day um, to cover the classes, basically that I was supposed to be teaching. Uh, and I was basically on sat in a hospital bed all day on my own, just trying to get comfortable. I just wanted to sleep because I was like, I'm in so much pain. You know, they were giving me so much morphine, uh, but it was still impossible to sleep unless you find the right position. But I, if, I, if I was in the wrong position, I couldn't adjust it. I couldn't move because it was so painful to even try to shift my, my butt on the, on the bed. I was like holding myself like this for hours at a time, just trying to not move at all, you know. And I was saying like, are they, I was still thinking that they were going to bring me in for surgery each day. So every morning they tell me, okay, maybe or well, in the evening they'll say like, okay, make sure you don't eat anything after midnight because the doctors will come around in the morning. They might be taking you for surgery in the morning. So don't eat anything. You're going to be like nail by mouth. Um, and then we'll let you know tomorrow in the morning. So I'm not eating or drinking anything. Doctors coming around say, oh yeah, there's a, a couple of cases that come in, but you're, you're still on the list for today. So just stay like that and then we'll, we'll be back around later to let you know if, if you're going to be we'll come and get you basically if if you're on 
if you're in the surgery. And then they kept coming around saying, oh, we don't know yet, we don't know yet. Later, about four or five o'clock in the evening, they come around, oh, so you're off the list for today now. So you can eat something now. So you all day. <laughs> yeah, all day until four, like four or five. And then they'll say, you're off the list, you can eat something. Uh, don't eat anything after midnight because maybe you'll be, be put in for tomorrow morning. And that happened like three days in a row. So I was spending three days of not eating, just waiting, 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 and then getting postponed to the following day until finally, I think, on the Wednesday. So I broke my leg on the Sunday. The Wednesday I had the surgery. That is fucking crazy. And that was, we probably skipped over some stuff, but talking about the surgery itself. So yeah. that was, the pain after the surgery is 10 times worse than the pain after the actual leg break. That was horrendous. Because I was, you know, the, the leg break itself, obviously you have like an adrenaline dump, right? When they snap, when your bone snaps like that and you're aware of the extent of an injury, it's like immediate adrenaline dump and it kind of manages a portion of the pain, right? So it's still painful, but you're, yeah, yeah. you know, you're, 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 you're in shock a little bit. You're just, like, you're just like, fuck. The, I remember the referee or somebody at the competition who was, I don't know who it was, if someone stood around me, oh, do you need a, do you need a medic? I was like, are you fucking mental? My <laughs> legs snapped in half. Of course I need a medic. What do you think I'm going to do? Walk off the mat? Like, what? It was, I was literally holding my shin together. Like you see on the video, yeah, you yeah, guys can a... put it on, mix it with this clip or whatever. <laughs> you see me sitting there holding my shin because if I let go, my shin would like fold in half. <laughs> I had to hold it straight. One of the, I think it's St. John's Ambulance or, you know, the, the volunteer medics that they have. Uh, older guy in his 50s, I think. He come over and he was like, oh, let me like hold it for you, the leg. Because I was holding it like this. He was like, yeah, look, pass, pass me your leg, basically. <laughs> and he held it. He said he was nearly, he nearly passed out. Really? He said he was moving so much. He was like, oh, God, and he passed out holding it. <laughs> Fucking hell, mate. So, yeah, the surgery, though. So, it was, it was brutal the next day. Surgery. What, what, what did they do for the surgery, first of all? So, basically, they, they put an intramedullary nail, which is a, basically a metal rod that goes down through your bone marrow, straight all the way down your shin bone, basically your tibia. So, they cut through my quads tendon above my kneecap. So basically, yeah, through my thigh, they cut an incision there, open that out, hammer, they hammer like a, this long, they call it a nail, but it's more like a iron rod or titanium rod, hammer that down from my knee to my ankle. And then they screw that in. So I've got two screws just under my knee. I got three screws down by my ankle, holding that rod in place. When they hammer that down, they're just hoping that the bone lines up nicely. They try their best to line up by hand, take an x-ray, hammer that down. And then sometimes it will be what they call like reduced if it's closed or if it's in line nicely, they'll say like it's like well reduced. But if it's not, then in my case, when they hammered the bone down, the, the bone didn't stay exactly how it was supposed to stay. It didn't stay perfectly in line. So as the nail was going into the broken part, it kind of like... Um, well, it shifted out slightly. What do you call it when you split the wood? Like, you know, when you split it this way. Splint. Yeah, when it's split, but yeah, the bone basically splinted off to the side like that. So now half of my shin bone is like splinted off and it's left a gap, basically a gap and a part of bone sticking out the side of my leg, let's say. So it's a kind of a lump where there's like a pointed edge of bone, which is still classed as acceptable. It's not like, um, it's something that will repair. So there's no need for them to do anything about that. Uh, but it's not ideal either because it's going to take a little bit longer than usual. The, the space between the bones a bit bigger than, than, you know, ideally. It would be nice and tight, so it's going to fix quickly, but it's kind of open, so this space has got to fill up with new bone. So that's fucking, basically, if you look at my x-ray now, my leg looks like it's still broken. We're like 14 weeks after the surgery now, so three and a half months, and it's still basically like open like this, starting to fill up with new bone. I can still, I can walk around and teach jujitsu now, but if you would look at the x-ray, you would think that I wouldn't be able to walk, right? Yeah, yeah. But based on how it looks now. Uh, so as well as putting that big, the, the nail down from my tibia, they also put a plate and five screws on my fibula because both bones were broken, right? So they cut a longer incision down the outside of my leg and put a plate on the fibula as well. So hopefully, hopefully everything will heal, um, correctly and I'll, the plan is to have the metal work out in maybe December so what would that be like uh, 10 months post surgery something like that it said between 6 and 12 months but they said the longer you can leave it the better basically so they're going to remove the screws if I wasn't doing jiu jitsu it could all stay in right? it's not a problem as long as my body's not rejecting the metal work it can stay in but the problem is the screws are like quite uh, protruded underneath the skin 
So if I try and do jujitsu, well, like, even when I'm teaching, if my legs are like rubbing over the screws, it kind of like grinds on on your muscles and tendons. You can feel it. It's painful, yeah, it's painful. It's not painful if I'm just doing normal stuff, but if I'm doing jujitsu, your legs get into much more crazy positions in jujitsu than in real life. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those the metal work which is external, like the one apart from the rod which is inside the bone that can stay there. Everything which is kind of under the skin needs to come out because. I won't be able to compete with all that shit in there. Yeah. And how did you adapt your like Obviously you make a living from coaching. Um, mm. So how did you adapt your coaching with this leg? Well, I mean, so I had the surgery on a Wednesday. I got discharged from the hospital two days later on a Friday. Um, and we were in the gym. I was in the gym teaching on a Monday. Obviously I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand up. I was sat on the side of the mat. Frank was helping me a lot. So luckily, you know, Finally, something paid off with me bringing him over. He's never to help out with something. Um, so he was like showing the positions that I was explaining. Obviously, we trained together for a long time, and I've taught him like seven days a week for the last five years. So he knows the, all the positions, like the way that I do the positions and things like that. So he's able to basically demonstrate what I'm trying to explain. So that's how we were doing to start with. He was showing the positions, and I would talk through it, like explaining the details and things like that until we come across a certain position that I thought, oh, I might be able to do that without, it doesn't require much use of this leg. So I can kind of show the position, like certain half guard positions and things I was doing myself, even with a boot on my leg, um, which is a bit dicey, you know, because obviously my leg snapped. So it's a bit risky. Yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't fucking believe it. I couldn't fucking believe it. I used to just like, yeah, fucking I, I used to, I used to wince, mate. I used to be like, oh. We even went and taught a seminar, like a, while I still had the boot on, right? So that was like four weeks after breaking my leg. So I couldn't walk yet. I was still on two crutches, uh, but we still and did the seminar. Again, Frank was showing uh, most of the stuff, but sometimes I'm like, oh, let me just show something. And then sometimes it gets a bit a bit hairy with the leg, like almost colliding with something, usually one of Frank's legs. Yeah, to be fair, mate, I mean, obviously we've both been to many of your classes during this period. And I, I've said a couple of times to people that I genuinely don't think your coaching has actually been hindered by your leg break much no, at all. Because no. I think you do such a good job of actually explaining the technique verbally. Mm -hmm. And as you say, you've almost got a second body in Frank. So personally, I've still taken tons away from the classes, mate, regardless of, of a broken leg or not. The only thing that I, like Danny, occasionally do is is certain movements. I'm Cringer. like, oh, oh. Yeah, I'll just fucking sometimes wince, mate. Sometimes I'm like... Uh, I've seen you know, the fear in your eyes a couple of times. I'm like, <laughs> like, I'm showing a position that it gets like really close to something. Like, what makes me laugh more is if Frank puts his foot in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Frank, don't do that. Like, Frank, move Frank this way. It's, what are you doing? It's when he like, when he reacts in a different way, trying to protect your leg, but actually puts it at risk by doing that. It's hilarious <laughs> to watch. Because normally we're pretty good at reading each other yeah you know we know each other pretty well like jujitsu and you know outside of jiu-jitsu obviously but especially when i'm teaching he know, normally knows how i'm reacting how i'm how i'm going to move next what i'm explaining and if he does something different i'm like whoa what are you doing because like, <laughs> i'm expecting him to yeah, like yeah. know what i'm doing you know yeah one thing i remember when you obviously put that post up when you first did leg break you you put the video up and dr kick ass also did like a breakdown of it as well which was was interesting to see but obviously there was a huge amount of comments um and it caused a bit of controversy because you obviously had some people saying it is what it is it's jujitsu other people saying the guy was a dickhead did you get involved in those comments at all and like what are your thoughts on all that i did initially when i was because one i was like still like furious mm -hmm. Like after, like the first day, you know, okay. So basically the only time I was engaged in any of that shit was the first day when I was lying in the hospital bed, like fucking still trying to run through the situation in my head, you know, still traumatized basically. I was like angry and just people writing shit online. I was like, yeah, fuck you people. Like, <laughs> I, I, don't, I can't even remember what I was writing, but like um, I was basically complaining about the whole situation. Just say like, oh, you know, it's fucking out of order. Break someone's leg like that, yeah. you know. But I'm not trying to get people to agree with my opinion i don't give a shit if somebody agrees with what i think or not it doesn't matter it's just what i think so whether they they can have a different opinion it doesn't make any difference to me so if they think oh you should attack quicker okay cool no problem for me that situation like like i said you attack a submission on somebody your mindset when attacking the submission is to get the guy to tap okay not to actually like disable them mm. right so generally what of course, in competition, you're going to go a little bit harder, but you're still ready to let go. 
you're still applying the submission with the intention of letting go when you get a tap, right? Some people's mindset's really different with that though, isn't it? Well, some people go right. out, some people go out to out people and that's the sad truth of it. Yeah, you get dickheads in all sorts of- Everything, uh, every sport. You know, <laughs> sports and, you know, careers and whatever. So it's not just in jujitsu. We think that like jujitsu is all good people, but unfortunately you get dickheads in jujitsu as well. So, um, and I don't really like, this this guy breaking my leg and, and doing like, um, you know, a bit of bad sportsmanship, let's say, like uh, being a bit of a an asshole. I don't really care. It's what it is. Like, it's not going to change the fact that my leg broke, you know. So when me being um, bitter or trying to complain to other people about that, it doesn't make any difference. My leg's broke. I'm mo more focused on my recovery, not on, you know, getting somebody punished for something that's already happened. You know, because people were saying to me, like a lot of people send me messages, oh, you know, are they going to do anything about that? You know, you should complain. Why? Why am I going to complain? I signed up for the competition. I signed a waiver saying I accept injury. Yes, the guy was a bit of a dick. Yes, he was unsportsmanlike. But so what? If I complain or if I, you know, I accepted that risk by signing up for the competition, right? So yeah, it's what it is. Yeah, it's a good attitude, mate. And then obviously you, prior to that, like, like with Frank, you were a fairly prolific competitor. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts now on competing well, and coming back? The funny thing is, right, so we were competing so much. So I was in Cameroon for four years. Yeah, four years, exactly four years to the day. So before going to Cameroon, I used to compete a lot. I got my black belt something like six, seven months before going to Cameroon. So through purple, brown, and the initial like six months of black belt, I was competing a lot. You know, I basically was competing every month, let's say, for, for those last what would it be? I don't know, five years, something like that. Yeah. And then went to Cameroon and started teaching full time. And obviously the jiu-jitsu scene there is not what it is here. There's no, there's basically no jiu-jitsu, no jiu-jitsu competitions, no uh, opportunity to compete. So I stopped competing and started like coaching full time. Then when I came back with Frank, we suddenly jumped back into competing because I wanted to like lead by example, you know, sh show him basically didn't want him to go out and think he's on his own competing. Like, look, we're both going to go out and compete. I'll do as many matches as I can. I'll compete every weekend as well. Just so yeah. if it seems like uh, more normal for him. So he doesn't feel like I'm asking him to do something that I wouldn't do myself. You know, so I jumped back into competing and started doing, you know, all these matches. Got a few injuries actually. I injured my ankle. I've got a broken orbital last year in training. So I had a few, I had to miss a few from other injuries but by the time of like it got to like this year so we've done that for six seven months it got to like february this year and i was thinking fucking i'm, I'm i don't even feel the the desire to compete you know because we've done so much and it's just been like ridiculous like 20 competitions is so much to do in in yeah. a few months it's taken like such a beating on my body like i said i had a few smaller injuries like it's not really that small still broken orbit was quite serious you know like a, a fractured face basically um and a dislocated ankle as well as like your everyday you know niggles and i was just like i'm feeling so beat up from all these competitions i, I don't really want to do this one but again i felt like just the need i felt like i had a duty to compete one for sponsors you know for scramble not for them personally but like um they've given a lot to me and frank and helped me and frank a lot in the last few years you know bringing him to the uk paying for his flight supporting us with whatever we want to do helping us with some competition entries and things like that so i feel like if there's an opportunity to compete and it's a decent competition then if i don't do it i'm just basically trying to find excuses it feels like i'm trying to make excuses to myself why not to compete when i could just go and compete yeah. you know you always feel like you're trying to talk yourself out of it like oh yeah but i'm feeling a bit tired i'm feeling a bit like i don't feel like it so what like you, you can make that excuse with everything right you can always say like oh you don't feel like it but at the end of the day you've got to get out of bed and, and push yourself right so i was not feeling for the competition i said to uh, Frank and some of the other guys before that comp, I was like, I don't even want to compete this weekend. And they were like, well, why are you doing it? I was like, ah. You were saying it to me, you were saying it to me on the Wednesday when yeah, we were, like, we were doing that fucking little 3v3 thing. And you was like, yeah, I'm fucked. <laughs> and you had to cut a bit of weight as well, didn't you? 
uh, for that one. Yeah, I think so. I think he was not eating, not eating great that week. I don't know. But I, oh yeah, I think I did have to cut a bit away. Um, so I was not looking forward to it. Just feeling like let's get it over and done with. Just fight another comp. So in hindsight, probably should have listened to my body or you know instincts a little bit better. Um, because even the day of the comp, I said I'm probably just going to get my fucking leg broken or something today because I'm not feeling it. <laughs> I literally said that to Frank. I was like, I was like, I can imagine because the previous time that I was competing at the same venue, I'd hurt my ankle. Nothing broken, but I'd, you know, had a, an injury. And I was like, I knew I was traveling the following morning. I was like, chances are I'm probably just going to break my leg or something today. And then actually just my leg. So, oh, fucking hell. So probably as some kind of like inkling that like I wasn't in uh, the best like frame of mind to compete. You know what I mean? Like that I just pushed myself too, too much, much and yeah. needed to take a step back. But you... you it's hard to know where to draw the line, right? Because you, if you do that every time, you know, you, you could listen to yourself every time. You're always saying, oh, I don't really feel like it. Because I never really enjoy, I enjoy like um, the experience of competing after the fact, like that I've put myself through something that I didn't want to do. So I've tried, I've trained hard and um, put myself through a stressful situation and came out alive on the other side, right? Because it's so easy to not do it that when you force yourself to do it, you feel better. You know, any anything difficult, you force yeah. yourself to force yourself to go on a long run to do a workout you don't want to do. You feel better after. And it's the same with the competition. There's a lot of stress involved for me. Like on the week before the competition, I feel like I'm constantly on edge, even if I'm, even if it's not a big competition. I know that I'm gonna fight at the weekend, so I'm constantly, you know, I can't relax before the competition. So I was like, I'm tired of that feeling, feeling constantly on edge all the time. I, I don't want to feel like that all the time I'd rather just enjoy myself a little bit you know because I enjoy training but when you when you've got the comp coming up there's that hanging over you all the time yeah so should have listened to, to myself there but if I'd have listened to myself too much before mm-hmm. with those negative feelings I would have never competed in the first place yeah that's very you, true. And you've done pretty well in those comps though, haven't you this year yeah considering I was out for four years coaching kids and white belts you know I managed to come back and, and do pretty well I think uh can't remember I got something like 60 60 70 wins 60 or 70 wins yeah and fuck you know um, I think 15 oh, wow. losses or something something like that yeah that's pretty fucking good man <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's that black belt not well, the same numbers know. as Frank but obviously you got, he was fighting in a blue belt division so his division was much more stacked than mine yeah, you yeah. Know, like in black belt he had like I don't know 8 8 he had like 8 or 10 fights per day or something I'd have like 4 or 5 yeah. something like that so his numbers were getting up much more than mine but it's still a lot of black belt yeah that's a lot mate that's fighting weight and absolute as well so we, I did that absolute every time in those in those like circuits is there like serial competitors that you keep refighting and rebeating or anything like that because that must be quite weird because it's there's not there's obviously there's loads more black belts than you uh, used to be but there's not still like it's still loads. a small yeah, pool still though, still to small be speaking pool, yeah. isn't it so is there someone that you just see all the time you think fuck me I gotta beat yes. him again or he beats me again there's one one particular guy, I know my, guy. my old friend uh, Matt Inman, super yeah. nice guy, but we always end up in the same fucking division together. <laughs> right. I get on well with him. I don't know him like well personally, but we always have a chat at the competition because we're always in the same division. And then like, in that six month, we fought like 11 times <laughs> last year. Me and him fought what 11 times. Score? What was the score? 10-1 to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Poor Matt. Oh, sorry, sorry, Matt. 10-1. Sorry. Yeah. But... Um, it's a hard fight. So even when I'm saying like, even if I won 10 out of 11 yeah. fights with him, I was still like not going into any of those fights feeling like, okay, I've got this one because I'm like, he's got nothing to lose now. He's like, and he's also more motivated to, to get the win back, you know? So ev- some fights with him are really hard, you know? Um, just start with make fights, right? So it's my style of jujitsu just tends to work well with him but if you watch him fighting other guys in my division he's wrecking through people that yeah. are, I'm struggling with as well so he can beat you know another guy that's giving me problems but when I fight him it go, tends to go my way most of the time mm. but um, yeah so I, that's the one name that sticks out because it's ridiculous number of fights like <laughs> yeah, fights yeah in a year. there's some other guys that I would have fought like, maybe like two or three times um, but not more than that I think the the most I fought and any other person is three times and then Matt's like 11 is there anyone in particular that you've fought that you thought fucking hell he's, he's mustard uh, yeah I don't remember his name but one Brazilian guy that fucking demolished me um, or just rocked up and just in the absolute yeah so he was like one weight division higher than me or something but it was an absolute 
absolute beat down. I was like, okay. <laughs> still, still levels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, you know, I was winning, like, a lot of fights, but there's always guys that are better than you, right? So, I'm not, I don't think, I, I know I'm not the best in the world. I'm not, like, fucking, you know, elite. Um, so, there's going to be guys every now and then that jump into the division, which are absolute killers, who are elite, you know. Um, yeah, I can handle 90% of my division, but then, like, I don't remember his name. I gave it, basically, I won... Um, so in the All Stars divi- in the All Stars uh, absolute division, you get prizes for first, second, and third. First gets five hundred pound in the black belt. Is it five hundred? No, three hundred. First gets three hundred pound in the black belt division. Um, second wins a gi, and third wins a rash guard or something like that. So he fucking, I think he. What, how did he beat me that time when I was? He choked me. Yeah, I think he cross choked me. No, the first one, he, like, demolished me when I was injured. Okay, so the time... So, basically, he submitted me in um, in our fight. It was kind of close for a, for a little bit, but I felt like I had it, it was, like, slipping away from me. You know, I was like, oh, I can't, can't handle this this guy because he's, like, crazy good pressure, very, very in- intense uh, guy to fight, and it was it's hard, right? So, as I felt like... I was kind of almost passing this guy, almost passing this guy, but I was losing the position and I was using too much energy, right? Because I, I knew I had to. It was either that or just get beat really quick. So I was like, I've got to give everything to try and beat him. And then when it started slipping away, I was like, oh, fuck, no, this, is, this is not going good. And he submitted me. So I got second in the division. He got first. So he took the money and I got a free gi. But obviously we got a sponsorship from Scramble. So <laughs> I don't need a free gi from, I think it was Valor or someone. So I gave him the gear because he's like a guy coming over from Brazil yeah. with not much money you know trying to make a career in jiu-jitsu as well and he fucking deserve it because he's an animal so yeah. I was like have if you want the gear you can have it yeah fair play mate so I guess with all all that kind of considered then so obviously where your head was at obviously prior to the injury um, obviously the, the new opportunity that you've got at Flow which we'll come on to in a second you know are your aspirations like still to come back and compete or are you going to focus more on coaching moving forward do you think now where, where's your head at currently uh, obviously we're teaching up Flow martial arts now in Plymouth. Me and Frank are permanently there. Like that was a unexpected opportunity came up, and Plymouth's not far from my hometown of Torquay, so everything kind of fitted in well. So we were happy to take that that job basically and start coaching up Flow. Um, my goal has always been to to basically open my own or have my own gym and lead my own team and like coach good competitors right so that's that was always my goal even before competing so i was only competing to give myself credibility as a coach or to to add my add credibility as a coach so i was never a competitive person growing up i didn't do any other sports until i until i started doing jujitsu so when i decided that maybe one day it'd be cool to have my own gym i was like well i need to compete i need to get some results i don't want to be like um somebody that's just talking out their ass they don't know you know that can't offer advice to anyone else so if i've got other people that want to compete in a gym i need to know what i'm talking about right so i started competing a lot with the the goal of like basically pushing myself as far as i can go so that one day when i transition to coaching i'll have some accomplishments right um and now i'm kind of doing both so i'm i feel like i still need to compete to stay relevant it's probably not the case but it's just kind of in the back of my mind because i've always been doing that now well, not always, but, you know, since at least 10 years, I've been 10, 12 years, I've been competing. Um, and I feel like you, this it helps you develop a lot. You're pushing yourself, constantly putting yourself outside your comfort zone and force you to, to take your training more seriously, constantly study new positions. Whereas I feel like if you don't do that and you're just training with guys in the gym, you can take your foot off the gas and, and stop. You don't really need to improve so much because generally, you know, when you're the coach of a gym, most people in the gym think you're fucking invincible anyway. So you can just like ride off into the sunset with that kind of like false sense of, um, of, a, of a, your ability, you know, whereas you step out on the competition mats and immediately like you fight some fucking Brazilian psycho <laughs> that's going to submit you in one minute, you know, so that forces you to evolve and, um, you know, and keep developing your game and also stay current with like the new wave of uh jiu-jitsu competitors and and 
their approach, you know, the techniques that they're using. So if I'm going to be a good coach coaching current guys, I can't be coaching like old school. I was never really like an old school style of jiu-jitsu anyway, but you know what I mean? It's always going to move on to the next, yeah, the next phase and um, the, the next, like the new wave of um, techniques. Okay, so that's basically, I'm kind of intending to keep competing, but it's not my main goal at the moment. So I want to keep competing to, to keep you know my finger in the in the pie kind of thing um but it's going to be hard to come back after this injury like uh, initially they said like uh six to nine months i was there you know different doctors talked to me in the hospital coming around every every morning it's a different person the surgeon said one year before competing but judging on how it's look it's doing much better than than i thought so at three months post-surgery it's ahead of schedule I would say is I'm like physically in my movement and things like that are improving much faster than expected if you look at the x-ray it's a different story so like the internal healing is not fast it's about on schedule I would say but I don't think I'll be competing in one year I think it's going to take longer because it's going to take it's going to be about a year post-surgery until they remove the metal work and then I'm going to have to heal after that as well so that's going to take two or three months and maybe I'll start competing in the gi before no gi you know so you've got less emphasis on the the foot the, the foot locks and the leg locks and then it's the mental side of it as well mate isn't it being comfortable with moving on it grab people grabbing it you know the, the rotations all yeah. that type of stuff yeah well so i'm not going to start competing until i'm able to basically resist foot locks and fight foot locks play a uh, leg lock game in the gym if i can't do that in the gym I'm, i've got no business being on a competition mat right so it's easy one to figure out if i'm ready or not if i can't you know, if I'm not comfortable in those situations in the gym, then I'm not ready to compete. So it's, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes with time, but I reckon it's going to be something like a year and a half post-surgery until I can compete in the gi, maybe closer to two years, no gi. Yeah, all right, well, time will tell. But I intend, I intend to compete again. I'm not, a, like, I would like to even fight the same guy again, not to try and get payback, <laughs> you know, just to prove that, like, I'm not afraid to, to fight this guy just because he broke my leg. It's just basically an accident you know um and i'm still confident in my jiu-jitsu i'm still confident in my ability to like uh to improve and and fix my mistakes and come back stronger you know yeah it's good man so obviously you mentioned that you're now full-time coaching at flow martial arts mm -hmm. so obviously when we had you on the podcast previously you were traveling about a lot doing seminars and i think you had aspirations to like create a team up in london yeah um, obviously you got a phone call heard that film martial arts were without a head coach and were invited down to come and have a conversation. So when you walked into film martial arts for the first time, what, what did you think? So for us, it's a bit funny really, because uh, Flo, I knew about Flo for a long time, because obviously I'm from the Southwest, I'm from Torquay, which is like less than an hour from Plymouth. And I used to travel down to Plymouth to train with a few friends in other clubs there, but I didn't know anyone from Flo. I knew the, the previous coach, um, but not well, I just knew it. I met him before and, and spoke like amicably on a couple of occasions, but never had like any, I never, we never really like uh, trained together or knew each other more than that, you know? Um, but for the impression I got beforehand was that the gym is very closed off to outsiders and there was not much like cross training going on. No one that I knew from all the other clubs in Plymouth seemed to go there. And it was kind of like a, a separate thing. So I remember you guys telling me like, Oh, you should come down. You know, it's a nice facility and whatever I was thinking how can I come down and play like it's like closed? Like <laughs> we it didn't feel like we were outside as well, welcome inside the gym there, you know. Um but when we when we started, like obviously when we got the call to come and teach there, it's different, right? So we we started um teaching and after a couple of weeks I felt like the the atmosphere changed completely and it was like now much more open. We got guys coming from other gyms coming to train with us. You know, our guys are going to train with with other guys in other gyms it, we're now more part of the local community i would say like more of the the local jiu-jitsu community than before so i feel like how it is now at flow i feel is completely different to how i perceived it to be when i was on the outside what did you make of the facility when you came in the yeah the facility like is basically the best uh the best martial arts facility that i've seen one of the best in the country, I would say. 
one of the best in the country, definitely in the Southwest. You know, there's no gyms like that around here. You know, most gyms are just a, a mat area. You know, you got just a mat area and and maybe so much change, right? But flows, like you've got massive, massive gym, two big mat areas, a cage, um, weights gym, you know, a coffee shop, a bar, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Bars are currently closed, so if you're coming for that, then wait a bit longer. Mm. But um, yeah, so the, the facility in general, very nice um, and upper class, I would say, very, very clean as well. That's one thing that I know it's about flow compared to nearly every other gym. I've seen like I've seen clean gyms, but they're a bit OCD. Of flow. It's fucking spotless, they're fucking mate, cleaning yeah. the place like five times a day, like after every single session, going around with like some you know crazy machinery <laughs> cleaning everything clean every kind of like piece of dust and so it's always completely like immaculate in there um which is good it's great obviously luckily i'm not the one that has to clean it so that's a good thing if it, if it was me it would not be that clean like just, just from sheer like laziness i wouldn't be able to keep it that clean but it, it is super clean basically so if you're a clean freak come to flow <laughs> come, and eat, come and eat your food off the fucking floor it'd be lovely yeah <laughs> literally you probably could it's probably cleaner than a fucking plate yeah, yeah. <laughs> and obviously you you know a lot of people locally to flow as well so obviously a few other clubs around um what was the kind of response like from from people that you knew locally about you coming down and, and taking on that role of full-time coach there yeah that was um quite interesting actually because when when Flo called me to ask me to come down and coach, I wasn't sure how that would be perceived by like everyone else in the area, but as in coaches at other gyms that I was friends with, you know, because I was never really like a part of any any gym. I wasn't competing with any other gyms in Flo, uh, in Plymouth. So to now jump into a coaching role in a rival gym, let's say, I was like, oh my God, now my friends in the other gyms that my, you know, the guys that are running the other teams might, like oh fucking hell what's he doing coming down but everyone was quite supportive to be honest like and welcoming of flow becoming like more of a part of the community and they knew that obviously with me teaching there that i don't give a shit about politics and things like that so you know coming from I, i've never trained in a gym like that you know that is super political so everywhere where i've tra trained up until now has always been uh, like super open door policy you know welcoming of anyone from any clubs you know and i like to do the same thing i don't i don't see any reason why things need to be closed off and you know you need to be shitty talking bad about other gyms and other teams and things like that you know why can't we just all train together in the end of the day it's just training right everyone's just training everyone's just trying to have fun improve uh and you know get better at jujitsu so if we can do that it doesn't matter if you do that behind closed doors or not like you're still you're still doing the same thing at the end of the day. It's not going to benefit you to shut yourselves off, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think it's great, mate. I th it's been great having sort of some of the new faces coming in and, and training with lots of different people. I so think many awesome. different people coming in all the time in there from different gyms and just popping in and out. And like y y yesterday, just uh, Ricky Bellingham coming over and doing an hour with Frank. I was like, so fucking cool. Yeah, exactly. So like guys like Ricky from Checkmate, they never come over before, no. before we were there. They would never even step foot in the gym, even though it's only like... 10 minutes down the road from their place, you know, and now like we used to pop over there all the time. So I'll, I'm still, you know, when I'm able to train, I'll still go over there and train with them. They come over and train with us um, whenever they like, you know, we're, I'm open to anyone. There's nobody that I'm like, uh, I don't see the point. It's a waste of energy, right? If you're trying to like have problems with people and, and be, you know, too focused on shit talk and gossip and stuff, it's, it's a waste of energy. We all like the same sport. They're all nice people. That's what I always say. Everyone's got bigger problems to do. Oh, yeah. It's like just fucking jujitsu, man, isn't it? at the end of the day. Yeah, and the more people, like, Southwest is like isolated enough as it is. We don't need to isolate ourselves within the Southwest. Yeah, you know, within each other. Yeah. It's already like kind of like a shallow talent pool, let's say. Yeah. Mm. So we need to basically come together. All the gyms need to come together to, um, to give up and coming athletes the best possible chance to. To do well, to do well, and, and to raise their level to similar level to the guys in their bigger cities and bigger clubs. No, I agree with that. 
So you've now got this team, you've now got this sort of facility, like this has obviously been an aspiration of yours for a while. Like now you've now you've got it. Like what 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 are the, the aspirations now for Flow specifically? Which what do you want what do you want to achieve with them? The goal first is to grow the team and get as many people like training as possible so that we've just got uh, you know, a busy good atmosphere at the gym all the time. You know, we want people to have plenty of training partners. You don't want to be, you know, one guy that's trying to you know, whatever your goals are personally, whether that's competing or, or not, you need to have plenty of other people at the gym with the same goal, okay? So that you've got like-minded people that you can work with. So if you're going there for fun, you need other people in the gym that are there for fun so that you can have similar people. You can have like a, a good atmosphere. You can enjoy your training, training with people with the same goals. Same thing with competitors, right? We need other people that are looking to push themselves so that, if, if you, you don't want one guy and he feels like he's got nobody else to push him, you know, um, we, we need to grow the, the students basically and try to expand in all areas so that we've got plenty of people for people to, to train with, competitor or not, in different age groups, men, women, kids. You know, we need like, at the moment with the, when we restarted the kids' classes, obviously because they got stopped when, like when we took over, uh, and trying to build that back up from from low numbers, you know, when you've got a couple of kids, or when you've got a class with only a couple of people inside, it's very hard for the people that are training. You know, so we need to start getting the numbers up in the classes to make the training experience better for everyone. Okay, because I know we can deliver like on the teaching side of things, but we need also bodies to teach too. Mm -hmm. like, you need people there to to train with each other. You know, you can you can teach someone all day long, but it gets very like um, it's very hard. To, to keep motivated if you're not you don't have that camaraderie with lots of teammates right when it's just a couple of you in the gym so that's the goal to grow the numbers at the moment and eventually grow the, us into the biggest gym in the southwest you know and create um a, a higher standard of jujitsu overall in the southwest try to bring the level down here up to scratch with the level up in the biggest cities in london in birmingham you know those kind of places so that People who don't feel the need to move from the southwest to, if they want to pursue a career in jujitsu, there should be somewhere down here which can offer the, the same level of training. Mm, yeah, but that's obviously going to take time for us to build up, to have a decent stable of competitors and uh, athletes training at our place. You know, it's going to take time, but I think we can offer the, the, the coaching and, at least yeah, from the the coaching side of things, we've we've got that covered. We just need athletes that are interested in competing to work with basically yeah i think that'd be brilliant mate i mean i i work in london a fair bit so i get to some of the gyms up there and the the standard is very good in london mm -hmm. and also like the the amount of different places like that you can go to it's it's great so it's uh depends you have that in the southwest i agree i think we've got all like the right play all the all the things in the right place now i think mm -hmm. you've got the facility you've got you down here coaching again the striking coaches i think are brilliant as well um, and I think just sort of opening up to the local community, there's a really good opportunity. And like you said earlier as well, you're getting so many people coming in now. Um, the classes are getting busy. We've got like a really good like squad of white belts that are just yeah. Those, really some of them tough. are going to be a fucking nightmare in a year or two. Yeah. They're doing my head in already. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. People think that like um, you know, there's there's not the interest. There's not the level of interest oh, for is. that. But there, there is. It's just there's no, you need somewhere. You need a place where you're actually able to train and someone that's going to try to like uh, encourage you to to train and, com and compete and things like that. You know, if everyone's like, oh, trying to play it down, trying to talk you out of competing, then you're going to go along with that. But if there's, you know, if that's the part of the culture of the gym, then hopefully we'll be able to change that yeah, yeah. like perception. Yeah, and do you know what? Even just like looking around at some of the lads now, just having you and Frank there coaching with your competition, like enthusiasm and experience and success, you can already see like the attitude of some of the some of the lads in there, like how keen they are to compete. And it's it's awesome to see, mate. So I think it will continue to grow. And you've got a good age group of some of those white belts. They're like young, you know what I mean? Some of them are 18, 19, 20. So even though it's obviously not as young as Frank and whatever else, but still a good age to kind of find it. I wish I was like 18 and found jujitsu, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, by the time they're fucking 24, 25, they're going to be fucking assassins. Yeah. That'd be good, mate. Hopefully. Just keep, keep your eyes out for us. 
in a few years time it's going to take time though obviously we're not expecting to like do miracles and have like a fucking killer squad in like six months or one year you know with Frank I was training with him for four years before he even competed in jiu-jitsu you know so it takes time if you want to um, have that deeper level of understanding and, and skill mm-hmm. you know if you you can get good at a few positions maybe in, in a short amount of time but if you want to be well-rounded and you have a complete game it's going to take time I think the the numbers have grown massively though in the last few months haven't they mm-hmm. compared so, to what they yeah. were like when we started when well, when you started it was like big exodus a few people's come back but the, the amount of new people we've had through the door is incredible and I, I think it's got you know it's just the atmosphere you're creating mate it's, it's fantastic yeah people just see we, we don't give a fuck that's why people yeah. just that just, just to do just jiu-jitsu to yeah we just like jiu-jitsu you see like we're not really interested in you know when we're in the gym it's just jiu-jitsu obviously there's a lot of banter as well and shit talk I don't you know I like to talk a little bit of shit every now and then while I'm teaching because I just don't want it to be such a serious atmosphere all the time you know you, you can you can't be taking yourself so serious that you need to be so strict and and um regimented you know yes some discipline and things like that but i feel like there's a there's a balance i find everyone's really successful uh, really respectful to that flow i find that there's not a lot of ever real disrespect or talking or you know everyone really respects you there definitely yeah it's trying to balance that yeah people becoming disciplined and uh focus with feeling relaxed and and comfortable yeah you know because if you don't want it to be like you're in a fucking dentist or in a like you're at school or something yeah told off all the time you know people need to be comfortable to be themselves in the gym so i think if they see that you're also human you also like make some mistakes like uh, you know you're not like a robot then that helps people like feel more comfortable and they can also they feel free to like make a few mistakes and they're not so worried about how they're presenting themselves to, to people because people are trying to put on a bit of a, like a, a face and trying to seem so professional that's one thing that i didn't like about working in a hospital right you you're basically working by like an inch you're you're living your life by an instruction manual mm-hmm. so you've got to basically present yourself exactly the same as everybody else who works in the hospital so you're like your behavior needs to be in line not not just in line but everything that you do and say is not your own it's not coming from you you're just repeating something else you're, you're the you're the nhs you're not yourself are you? <laughs> yeah you're like basically like a, a robot working for like a a bigger mm-hmm. organization a bigger like somebody else controlling you right whereas i feel like if you can be yourself and there's a bit more individuality it's a much more pleasant atmosphere and, and way way to you know spend your time yeah yeah agree obviously a lot of the uh, the students will probably watch this podcast mate at that flow and um and you know and, and plenty of people as well i mean what what's your kind of advice to to kind of people that are maybe sort of sort of starting out a flow and, and getting really into it at the moment like what should they be focusing on so the main thing i would say for everyone who is interested in like improving, I would say like doing jujitsu for any reason apart from just a little bit of fitness, okay? A little bit of fitness and whatever you do is gonna help. I mean, if you actually wanna learn jujitsu, you wanna get better, train as much as you can. Okay, just try, the more regular you are on the mat, the more time you're gonna be uh, practicing the techniques obviously and learning. Okay, it's a, it's a steep learning curve in the early days, right? When you're like white belt or even blue belt, whatever, you need to spend so much time training because there's so much to learn that it becomes overwhelming if you're if you're not putting the time in, right? And it's so hard to to get everything, all the pieces to come together if you're not putting the time in on the mat. So as you go through the belts and get higher belts, I think you can get away with less time training because you've already... <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I mean, like... So we were listening to a podcast yesterday with um, Cade Rotolo and uh, Mighty Mouse. Yeah, I saw that. Cade good. said that they, those guys only train like four times a week, sometimes five times a week. I'm sure they drill outside of that. I'm sure when he's saying training, they mean like a hard training session, not just like doing any form of jujitsu. But for me, that's I, I train every day. You know, when I'm training, I train every day. Um, maybe get one day off in a week. So we have like Sunday off or something, train half a day on Saturday, get Sunday off. But basically we're training morning, evening, every day. 
Um, but it just goes to show that when you're a higher belt and you spend so long, you know, obtaining the skills, uh, developing that skill set, that then you can kind of, you know, the the amount of learning you've got to do kind of slows down. But in the early days, if you want to give yourself a head start, you need to be on the mat or like a proper mat rat. <laughs> be there as much as you can. Try and uh, learn as many different positions as you can. But also to focus on a sp- position or two that you're going to try to develop to a higher standard. Mm-hmm. Right, so you need to have a general awareness of all the positions, like what's being taught. But you need to have like try to find a a guard. Or a, like, or a style of passing that you're able to focus on and develop. Fucking hell, alcoholic in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Funny we can hear that as Frank cracking his third thatches. Third, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, um, yeah. So you need to, you need to have something to focus on. That's you, you're going to develop to a high level. You need anyone good. They're good at. They're really good at a specific thing. Okay. You don't really get people that are super successful. Um, without having like an A game or a very strong part of their game, right? They're norm- normally good people, are good at putting you in their position. Adam Wazinski. Wazinski with his butterfly guard, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the um, analogy you told me when, uh, when you first came. He was like, his, his butterfly fucking sweeps are amazing. Started looking them up and I was like, fuck yeah, it. Shout out to Adam Wazinski for winning Black Belt Worlds. First ever non-Brazilian non-american world champion so hey, I've, I seen that, I've seen that table mate i couldn't believe it mate it's just fucking brazil yeah, flags fucking, we need to get these <laughs> brazilians like, off, the, off the podium me yeah. i don't know if it's a way, way that brazilians train in general that because obviously judas is pretty popular now like especially in the us and even in in europe for for the the podium across all weight divisions to be completely dominated by brazilians is still Maybe it's the way that they're training, the way they're just focused on training for competition and for winning uh, winning matches rather than just training jiu-jitsu. I think like a lot of the American and European clubs are like trying to do more dynamic jiu-jitsu, more submission only based, you know, that kind of, mm. a lot of guys are interested in that kind of thing. Whereas Brazilians are just there to fucking win tournaments, mm. you know, and they're trained just for that. They just need to get the win, which is obviously leading yeah. to a lot of success. But Adam's changing the, uh, changing the, you know, first step on a on a new path. Let's say. Hey, I, I just it's fucking super inspiring. I, I remember I, I read that he he's competed nine times at Worlds and he didn't even podium on any of them, and then he's just fucking gone and smashed it and won it. It's fucking amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So focus on one area of your game and develop that. And then how about when you're in the sessions, like the attitude and and what you should be doing in the sessions when you are there. I would say when you're when you're practicing techniques, like so when I show the techniques, I try to explain a lot of detail because rather than explain too many different positions, I'd rather explain like one or two positions, but try to get you to understand the position on a deeper level, right? Rather than just imitate the movement without understanding what you're doing. I think it's important, like if you wanna if you you need to develop the skill like to understand the position, understand how to how to learn how to improve not just how to do a movement Mm -hmm. okay because then you can apply that to other techniques other positions other areas of your life even it's not just with with jujitsu right so you need to learn how to teach yourself kind of thing so you become a teacher but also by becoming a teacher you learn how to teach yourself Mm -hmm. so i always like when i was teaching the kids in the foundation i always taught them how to teach you know i wanted when i'm teaching them a technique my goal is for them to be able to explain it back to me or to explain it to the other kids. And if they can't do that, then they haven't understood the technique enough, right? They haven't understood what they're doing enough if they can't explain it themselves. So I try and teach the guys in a way where they really understand the position. They understand why they're doing what they're doing. And in that way, it's going to stick like a, on a deeper level of their, their memory, right? They're going to, it's actually going to become, they understand it rather than just remember it. I think, I think, what I love about your teaching is that you break it down and then if, if they go away and you see something that a mistake, like, like something that they're making a mistake on or something, you like stop a second. I've just seen this come back in and then give us that variable that might actually happen when you're like live rolling. Um, you know, 
that that there for me is like fucking huge. Yeah, so that's something I do a lot, right? Is like um, try to explain the situation where the technique is going to be used. Okay, so rather than just show the movement, show that like here's a submission, we'll show like where you're going to be looking for that that technique from, and then what are the things that are going to happen you know, uh, when that can cause you problems. Yeah, that's right. it. That's it. It's what's like troubleshooting, cause, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, what's going to cause you problems when you're doing this technique, okay? Sometimes the guy's going to react like this or this, the, like the common ways, that, uh, common reactions that you're going to encounter and then try to get people ready for those things so that when you understand like, okay, when I'm applying this position, my opponent can do this and this and this. When you understand the reactions that are coming back at you, your understanding of the position, how to approach that position changes a lot. It was so valuable for me. So valuable. Yeah, and one thing that I loved as well, obviously, when we had the quintet, where obviously the guys were competing, <laughs> and yeah. just just seeing you frantically running around with your notepad and pen, basically just scribbling down mistakes, and and then just addressing that in the classes, and actually making like the sessions. Although there's a structure and a syllabus that you're following, and you're linking all that together, which is really cool. You're actually also tailoring it and making it bespoke for the people on the mats as well, which is great. Yeah, so we'll follow like um, so the way that I plan. Um, what I'm going to be teaching is like I'll have like a list I like broke down basically like jujitsu into its component positions like in my mind okay which the majority of those positions are guard positions okay so there's more guard positions than there are control positions right so you have like a long list of different guards some of them are specific to gi some of them are specific to no gi some of them are in both um, but then you have some other positions like mount side control back turtle north south neon belly you know positions that are like control positions rather than guts so we try and go through those in a way that like the most useful the most um the positions will come up most frequently first and then over time we'll get to the positions which are more niche okay which are like less common but important still important right you need to to be comfortable to be good in jiu-jitsu you need to understand basically every situation or every common situation that can happen mm -hmm. okay so like at the more different positions that you recognize the more comfortable you're going to be when you're rolling because there's never you're never in you're never lost you're never in any position where you're like what the fuck is going on i don't know you know you need to know like okay we're here i know like basic one or two uh concepts principles in this position how to react appropriately in this position Right. It doesn't mean you have to be a master of that position and have loads of killer techniques from there, but you need to at least know what it is and know the way the, the, the first steps in, in dealing with that position. Mm, yeah, 100%. And, and what are the common mistakes that you typically see from like students that might hinder their development in jiu-jitsu? Rushing. Rushing is probably the, the biggest one. So take, when you're practicing, take your time. You know, practice the technique slowly. Try to focus on the small steps. People always try and jump from like uh, A to Z. You know, want to go straight from like do the technique and jump, get straight to the the submission, finish finish the technique, right? But it's the the process. You just use a step by step um, process where you're going to be like improving your control step by step, or or um, breaking down your opponent's control step by step. Okay, so it's like you can't do that. There are, there are, of course, like some fancy flying moves and things where you like jump over a few steps and skip some steps, but they're few and far between. The majority of jujitsu is a very slow, methodical uh, art, I would say. So take your time when practicing it, otherwise you're going to miss a lot of important stuff. Yeah, you're just trying to understand that it's not the 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 whole movement which counts as the the break it down into parts and and try and understand and, and practice all the component parts not just like something which resembles the movement mm -hmm. yeah good advice mate thanks and then looking around at like jiu-jitsu in general at the moment obviously it's it's grown massively from the time when we, we first started and we had Dan Strauss on recently and he was joking about back when he started like blue belts were like these mythical creatures that you never saw um but said now that like black belts are more common than blue belts were back back some, um, which is I think it's a fair fair assessment. Um, 
I mean, what do you what do you think of the the current standard of jujitsu and black belts and, and everything else and, and, and belts in general? Because obviously, there's always talk of watering down and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So when I started jujitsu, um, my coach was a purple belt. We didn't have any black belts around at that time. Like it was like 2009, so it wasn't even so early in the history of like UK jujitsu. But even then, especially in the southwest, there was no. I don't know down in Plymouth here. Like obviously, you guys had. Um, Tom and Kenny teaching down here from, they, they think they were black belts before we had any black belts in Torquay, for example. But um, yeah, I never trained with any black belt when I was coming up, like white and blue kind of thing. Um, so the first time, yeah, the first time uh, training with a black belt or training under a black belt, let's say, was when I was already a pup belt. So my coach got to pro- promoted to black belt when I was purple. I think, I think that's about right. But yeah, so the, the standard, oh, you're trying to get me in trouble now. Um, just be honest, mate, just be honest. <laughs> so yeah, obviously with the growth of jiu-jitsu and people trying to make money out of jiu-jitsu and get more people interested, a lot of people get promoted to try and keep them on the mats, which is not necessarily like the correct reason for promoting somebody. You know, normally if you're promoting somebody, it should be like a... Um, acknowledgement of their not just their, their skill but their skill their dedication their passion um, their ability to teach in some cases you know so there's a lot of things going into it time on the mats is a factor but it's like a very small factor because time on the mats if you haven't done anything with it why why are you getting promoted for just that's like you know you're sitting on the side of the mat and you're going to get promoted for, for doing nothing so I think a lot of more, a lot of people being promoted uh, for the wrong reasons these days. Um, so it's kind of watering down the level uh, a little bit. But those people, if you're promoted, for, if you're promoted for the wrong reasons, you're promoted uh, past your your actual skill level. Then that's going to be become apparent as soon as you step on the mat in the competition, or in any other gym okay so if you get, if you're promoted past your level and you go to another gym to train you're going to know about it you're going to know that when you roll with everyone else who's wearing the same belt as you you're not going to be having a good time okay and even worse if you're in a competition because you know there's a general standard you always get some people which are like a little bit further behind or you know a bit, a bit um each end of the spectrum but if you're getting smashed by everybody that's wearing the same belt as you probably you got promoted a bit too soon so I think that happens a lot, you know, especially nowadays you see that happening more and more. Um, but each to their own, you know, like I said, you can get promoted, but if, that, if it, the color of the belt around your waist makes you happy, then good for you. Um, but I would, for me, it's more about your performance on the mat, okay? Performance and your your contribution inside the gym, you know, so if you're, yeah, if you don't deserve your belt, you're going to know about it. You're going to know it, right? You're going to realize pretty soon. Yeah, you will. Um, and then I guess last question in regards to Jiu-Jitsu, and it might be good to then catch up in regards to where you're at with Frank and the option and everything else. And this is maybe a shit question, I don't know. But being a black belt, like what does a black belt, kind of what does that mean to be a black belt? What do you think? What should it mean? Um, so I... Yeah, good question. I'm kind of, I'm not all improvise the answer to that one because I don't really know. I've not really thought about that too much. But first thing is someone that's dedicated to the sport. You can't be like, a, of course you get hobbyists, you get part-timers and that, but I think really like you, you should be either dedicated to the sport now or have been dedicated to the sport for a period of time, like uh, to either push yourself um to the to the higher levels of the sport or try to try to reach the higher levels of the sport um in terms of ability you know or trying to push others like so either you have to be making some kind of contribution whether that's with your own performances or helping other people's performances you know because if you if you're not doing either of those things then you just show up to gym learning a student you're not contributing you're not putting back into the, the sport in terms of performing on the mats 
you're not putting back in helping other people, then you're showing up just learning, just like every other student. So a black belt is someone that's uh, giving back to jujitsu in a way, in a way. Nice, perfect. Okay, mate, so obviously last time we saw you, you obviously got yourself in a bit of a pickle in the sense that you'd obviously been to Cameroon, you'd adopted uh, Frank and uh, another lad, Brian, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brian, so it's a different situation with him. He's not like, um, we never did a legal adoption okay. with him, but he was living with us as a part of our family okay, yeah, yeah. there in Cameroon. So at the moment, he's he's 16 at the moment, so he's still going to school in Cameroon. Yes. Um, Frank was like not doing well in school and he's like, Brian's doing okay. So it's yeah. a bit of a different story. Um, so he can stay in school. He's probably got a bit of a better chance of succeeding. Frank was like, yeah. Just, uh, so he actually disaster. went. He actually went to school, unlike Frank. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, fine. <laughs> um, so there was the obviously the lads, and then you obviously had your uh, your other half, the stepson, and then obviously uh, your own little boy, Leandro. Yep. Um, and obviously you were traveling about, trying to raise funds to try and get them into the country. So where are we currently at with that situation? Okay, so um, with, with regard to Frank's situation, um, we are working with a lawyer, a good immigration lawyer. Um, it's quite expensive. The, the plan is to put in an application for leave to remain based on human rights. So basically it's a breach of human rights to be sep uh, separated from your family, whether that's your biological or not, a biological family or not. So... Um, that's the route that the lawyer thinks is our best chance of success um, because of the ongoing relationship. They said even before we did the legal adoption, so even before I legally adopted Frank in Cameroon, we would have had a case for the same thing based on the fact that it was um, like a de facto adoption. So because he lived with me and considered me like his father, that counts as a de facto adoption, even if you don't have the paperwork. So they said even without the that, we could have still, you know, put in a human rights application. Now we've got the paperwork as well, so that helps a little bit, a bit of a legitimacy. Um, so at the moment we've put in an application for legal aid um, and a fee waiver application. So the legal aid is to help with the lawyer's fees. Okay, to basically because Frank doesn't earn any money um, and doesn't have any savings and uh, I don't earn enough to pay for all his legal fees. So that's why there's like a, we have the option to do that, but they refused that one already. So they refused the legal aid, which is for the lawyer. The fee waiver application is for the home office fees. Okay, so we're still waiting for that at the moment, the decision on that one. Um, as soon as we get the decision decision back on that, we can proceed with the actual leave to remain application. But we can't do anything until it's, it's all step by step. So you can't do the, we can't go any further, any further without having decision on the previous part so at the moment we're just waiting basically waiting for this uh, uh fee waiver then we're likely to it's going to take a couple more months probably then once we've got the legal sorry not legal once we put the leave to remain application in that's probably going to take six months to a year for a decision back on that they said that's likely to be refused so we're going to have to put an appeal process in which is gonna take another six months to one year, roundabout, could be longer, could be shorter. Um, so the whole process is gonna take likely two years, maybe more, maybe less, something like that. Um, and it's gonna cost us about 8,000 pound. So we, we started doing um, some fundraising last year. We went around doing a lot of seminars um, and some people were donating just, uh, just to help us out. So we've got a GoFundMe account and we've raised about half the money so far. So there's about £4,000 in the account, um, which pays for the first part of the application. The first part of it is his legal fees. So we're going to need to raise about another four grand to pay for the rest and another £25,000 for all his food that he's eating. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. So yeah, um, we're a separate fundraiser, Frank's Food Fund. It's going to be much more expensive than the legal fees, trust me. Yeah, okay. And while we're on the, the subject of Frank, yep. um, how do you feel about his jiu-jitsu performance since he's been in the UK? So yeah, he was doing super good. Frank was doing super good in the the blue belt competitions, like smashing everyone. Um, 
had a lot of matches, a lot of wins, you know, a lot of good performances. Um, and he's had a, a few good performances like that in Purple Belt so far, but a couple of competitions in Purple Belt not gone his way. And I feel like that's just from being overconfident and not respecting his opponents enough. You know, so he's thinking that he's going to have too much of an easy time, uh, you know, and doing too much rushing, trying to get the finish and making mistakes along the way. So it's just a bit of maturity that he needs to grow into. Uh, and that will come with fighting higher level guys, you know, a bit uh, after he's fought a few more opponents. I think he's improving already, but um, he has a lot of potential, like um, his ability. I think even right now, he's good enough to beat any purple belt in the UK, I would say. From what I've seen, like we're, we're, we're pretty, um, you know, frequent on the competition circuit, right? So I've seen a lot of other matches. I've not seen any other purple belt. Um, that I think like is is way above his level. You know, it's always someone that he can ha he could handle. But of course, he's lost to a few of those guys, right? So something's missing. So his technical level is good enough, but I think it's just a little bit of experience to fight a bit smarter sometimes and not fight like a fucking savage. <laughs> basically, which is is good. That's it, one of his good attributes as well. The fact the the fact that he's always moving, he's always having like a dynamic and interesting fights. But sometimes those fights aren't going to go your way. So you need to know when to switch on the war mode and when to like slow it down, slow it down and control the fight and and get the win when you've got a tricky opponent. So it's it's having that. Um, knowledge. He's, he's and still so young, isn't he? Like he's fucking eighteen. This this. Man. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Like he, like I said, he could. If he was a, a, just a bit better at like deciding what to do, mm. using the techniques he already has, using the skills he already has, uh, just um, a bit better strategically, it could beat everyone already. But it's going to take a little bit of time to to get that up to speed as well. So his decision making doesn't fully form until he's 21. There you go. So it's 21. We've got to wait a few years, right? Honestly, seriously, scientifically, you will not. You will make rash decisions up until he's the age of 21, naturally. We've got, yeah. But you still got savages in the, you know, in these days there's guys like Miki Galvao and Rotolo's obviously that, you know, are still, what, I don't know how, how they are right now, but they're like 18, 19, 20, whatever. Yeah, it's insane. And I guess obviously we, we're aware obviously of the, the travel restrictions with Frank at the moment. How do you think he fares kind of on the sort of European or world stage? At the moment, not well. I don't think, if I'm being honest, like, because I would just say how I think, like, at the moment, because he has a technical level, like I said, to, to beat to be very like um, on the podium on the big tournaments, but he's lacking some of the decision-making skills to to get the victories over those kind of guys at the moment. So he need got a bit more work to do. Yeah, well, it sounds like there's going to be a little bit of time before he gets the opportunity to do that. Yeah, anyway, so, that's, so that's the good thing. It's like we've got time to fix that, right? Because it's yeah. going to be like two years probably before he can travel to to do any of those international tournaments. But you know, we want to try and fix that before before then so that by the time he does have the um, the right to travel that he's ready for those tournaments yeah it's quite exciting isn't it really because he's so young got so much time now on his hands can't really go anywhere just concentrate on his technique and just mm -hmm. keep pushing him yeah no no chance of him falling off the wagon and getting on the beers and maybe maybe meeting a nice young lady then maybe you never know <laughs> you never know nah, I, think, I think you slap him and get back in line <laughs> Yeah, that's like, it's different for him though because he's like, you know, coming from a very poor place with, um, he's got a very good understanding of like what he doesn't want in life. So, it's, here kids grow up spoiled and they think they can just, you know, do whatever and, you know, they can always do something else. But Frank knows that how much he's put into this already and how much um, it means for like his life and, and his family as well. The other thing I was going to quickly add on to that obviously with his age and jiu-jitsu and everything else have you ever thought of doing like some MMA yes because like he's a fucking little tank mm -hmm. he's a bit like Mike Tyson type body. yeah and, and at Flow we got some fucking really good striking coaches and you know if you really look at where he's come from he's definitely got that fucking dog in him you know mm -hmm. so you know what, have you ever thought about going down that road a little bit yeah so the plan I think Frank's plan is eventually to do MMA um, but wants to also be champion in jiu-jitsu, right? So as he's um, like currently focusing in jiu-jitsu, I think if he wants to 
to become world champion in Jiu Jitsu. It's best to stay like primarily focused on that initially until he can achieve that goal and then start looking to transition over and do MMA as well. Obviously, in the meantime, he can be training a bit of striking on the side, it's, but like at least 90, 90, 95% of his training should be focused on Jiu Jitsu at the moment. Mm -hmm if he wants that if he wants to get uh, you know those titles and, and beat the best guys in jiu-jitsu because if you spread yourself too thin across too many different disciplines other guys are not doing that other guys are focused on being the best in, in one discipline right so to, to beat those guys you need to put in the work right and if you're doing too many different things it's going to be hard to outwork those guys yeah but also like you've got the, the main reason for doing that is money Right, to earn money. The, the well, that's what I was say, potential yeah. in MMA generally is much more than in Jiu Jitsu. Um, but if Jiu Jitsu, the landscape of Jiu Jitsu is changing and they're starting paying a lot of money for certain tournaments, um, if, if there was a potential to earn the same money in Jiu Jitsu than MMA, then why go across to MMA and have to get punched in the face? Well, that's what Gordon Ryan says, isn't it? He doesn't, he doesn't need to go across, does he? If it? you're earning good money in jiu-jitsu, it's a different story. The, the reason for going to MMA would be because it's not the same opportunity. But, um, yeah, with Craig Jones putting out shitloads of cash for, for jiu-jitsu tournament now. So, uh, hopefully, might change things going forward. We'll, we'll have to wait and see, yeah. like, over the next couple of years, if that becomes, like, a more of a, a common thing. Or if it's kind of like Craig's just going out on a limb trying to trying to help us out and it's going to fall on its face. But. Yeah, I think you end up with a, probably a, a, a couple of comps that offer like decent pain. There'll be a very small percentage of opportunity or a small percentage of athletes yeah. to have an opportunity to earn good money in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, jiu to be elite level as it, you know. Yeah, but I think it was, again, something we talked about with Dan Strauss, but jiu-jitsu is never going to be mainstream like MMA is. Mm -hmm. So I think you're still going to get probably a sort of a, a better opportunity broadly speaking to our money in mma well that's what that's the thing right you were saying about um if you have the same money in jiu-jitsu why go to mma and get punched in the face it's the getting punched in the face which gets you the money that's yeah, yeah. what it's people exciting, want to watch people it? want to watch you get punched in the face so if you're not if you're not getting punched in the face no one wants to watch you yeah you know when you watch mma you like i prefer to watch mma than jiu-jitsu yeah. you know i don't want to compete in mma but i like to watch you uh, jiu-jitsu competition can be really boring can be exciting depends uh, there's more, a lot more um, scope for a lot more variation I would say in the excitement levels of jiu-jitsu matches than in MMA you know most more often than not uh, fights are going to be entertaining right? more often than not of course you get really exciting fights and boring fights but boring fights are less common in MMA than they are in jiu-jitsu because you, they're getting hit. So there's always some level of uh, excitement going on. <laughs> so maybe combat jiu is the way forward. Mm, maybe that's a stepping stone. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, we'll see, man. We need to get Frank in some combat jiu matches. So if anyone wants to say, come and slap Frank up in a, in a match, hit us up. We can travel around the country. That'd be good. <laughs> has, he done any, has he done any like jits with hits or anything yet? Only fucking round in the gym, you know, sometimes <laughs> trying to beat him up a little bit. Dad put some fucking gloves on there the other morning. Yeah. Yeah, I was crying. It's, it just changes the dynamic it's, it's so much. A bit of striking, you know, but um, not really focused on MMA training, just a bit of kickboxing. And then obviously it's jujitsu training. So. Yeah, mate. Well, you know, I think, I think that the community are behind you, mate, in regard to obviously supporting you and Frank and, 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 you know anything else you want to try and kind of get done um if people do want to support and, and kind of reach out like how can they do that obviously you mentioned there was a gofundme page that's still live yep we've still got the gofundme which i think the link for that's on our mine and frank's instagram page i think um so yeah uh if anyone's interested in supporting uh, me and frank and helping frank pay his legal fees so that he can stay here with me in the uk keep competing in jiu-jitsu then uh, we're available for seminars okay seminars or private lessons but private lessons obviously is you know you can travel a bit less you don't have the ability to travel so far we can basically get to anywhere in the UK outside the UK is currently out of bounds because of Frank's visa issues but any UK seminars anyone interested in hosting us that would be great to help with Frank's fundraising and stuff um, so just contact me via Instagram it's the easiest way um, I'm now able to teach Jiu Jitsu to, to almost to a normal level you know like with the leg uh, after the leg break so I'm, I'm fully functional now um, not with sparring but teaching wise there's not really any issues so yeah. we can get back on the seminar circuit again start raising some more money now 
Yeah, I'll definitely second that. And uh, and then finally, like anybody you want to shout out and say thanks to for support so far? Yep. Main guys that are always helping us out are the guys from Scramble. So Matt and Ben, thank you for like helping us out for so long. You know, they've been supporting me for about 10 years now since I was a purple belt back in training in Brazil. Um, and then since I moved to Cameroon in 2019, so there's five years supporting me and the foundation, you know, giving all... Uh, all the keys and everything for the kids there and also paying Frank's flights twice to the UK, um, bringing him on to shows like Polaris or helping getting him on shows like Polaris. So without them, we'd be probably, under, you know, it would be in a lot of a, a lot more of a difficult situation. Um, and obviously everyone else supporting us, everyone that's donating to Frank's GoFundMe and anyone like, you know, sending support for us, then... Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for coming on, mate. Thanks, mate. Cheers. 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 Cheers